Fogren, who is going to talk about the constructing quantum K theory invariants of Calabrio manifold. Okay, let's go, Martin. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, as uh, Hossein said, uh, I will talk about some of uh, my more recent work uh, concerning constructing quantum K theory invariants of Calabrio manifolds. Um, maybe a little disclaimer in the beginning. I will talk uh, quite little about my work. I will mention what I'm working on at the moment and uh, what are some the directions that we are pursuing. Uh, but most of the talk will be uh, mostly based on uh, like review of the work that was done mostly by um, Hans Jokers, Peter Meyer, Alex Tabler, and Umi Niemann. So um, for the agenda, I will first present the background. I will talk a little bit about uh, quantum cohomology and then how to build uh, quantum K theory and about the given tiles J function. Then I will talk about supersymmetric localization. Uh, very briefly, I will just mostly present the results and how to actually compute the J functions. Um, I will present um, in some detail the Quintic example and um, I will uh, highlight some other examples that have been computed in the literature. And finally, I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, what I'm interested in and uh, what I'm working on at the moment. Uh, so let me start with some background. Um, and uh, firstly, I would like to just uh, maybe remind everybody a little bit about quantum cohomology because uh, quantum K theory will be uh, will be very similar to, I mean, the whole construction for quantum K theory will be very similar to this classical construction of quantum cohomology. So the main object uh, that we will be interested in or that will play a major role in constructing quantum cohomology is MGN bar, the modular space of stable maps. And uh, points in MGN bar are point holomorphic maps uh, from a genus G curve, sigma G, with n marked points, p1 to pn, um, and uh, they map to a target space x, which is typically, I mean, in uh, my research, is typically a Calabria manifold, or even more specifically, a Calabria threefold. And we also require that the class of the curve in the Calabria uh, is uh, some fixed class beta. Uh, we also have the evaluation maps. So the evaluation maps, what they do, is just they evaluate each one of the mark points uh, so with the with the map. And then we can define the gromo whitney invariants. I mean, so these are the most basic gromo whitney invariants, no uh, gravitational descendants, uh, no deformations, as the integral over NGN bar of the evaluation maps uh, for some classes gamma i in the cohomology of X. And uh, we define the quantum cohomology ring as the classical cohomology uh, tensor product with the uh, power series in Q1 up to QH2. And the quantum product is given by, uh, so summing uh, phi i, so phi i is some basis of H star of x uh, with the Gromo with the three point Gromo Witten invariance. So there's three mark points uh, in the Gromo Witten invariance. Um, and further, we define the given tiles cohomological J function as this uh, sum where, uh, I mean, the important thing here is that in the sum, there are these correlators appearing. So phi i are uh, a basis of H star of X. And there's these correlators that appear in a power series. And this uh, very strongly resembles the periods of uh, Calabria manifolds. And in fact, in the J function, all the periods, so all the information about the periods of a Calabria manifold is encoded already. So here, if you expand this in classes in H, uh, then this will, the coefficients before will just be the periods of the Calabria manifold. Okay. Uh, so similarly to quantum cohomology, where we had so the standard product in uh, cohomology, which is the wedge product, got modified by some quantum correction when we computed the gromo witten invariance. In quantum K-theory, the standard product in K-theory, which is the tensor product, gets modified by some additional uh, quantum corrections. Uh, and these quantum corrections are parameterized by a large Q. Uh, 
uh, again, for uh, quantum K theory, we can define the analogs of Grumman with invariants, so some correlators, by taking the holomorphic Euler characteristic of MGN bar, or, I mean, with respect to MGN bar of the structure sheaf a tensor product with the evaluation map at the uh, mark points. And the holomorphic Euler characteristic can be computed through this index formula. So uh, there's this thought class and the churn classes of each vector bundle A and B. Um, so this IGN beta, similarly to the quantum cohomology case, defines the quantum product, which modifies the natural tensor product in the K theory, uh, which gives rise to the quantum K theory. And again, analogously to the quantum cohomology, we also have the k-theoretic j function, which is again uh, a power series uh, in q beta here, and phi i, which are the elements here of the k-theory, and uh, here are the correlators. So these correlators, again, they play a very similar role as the expansion coefficients for the periods. Uh, what's very important and what's different here, uh, or somewhat different, is that there is this part tq, which is called the input, so this is a part, uh, I mean, uh, I'll explain uh, in a second how to get this TQ, but this TQ is called the input and it plays the role, which is very similar to the role of the mirror map uh, in the two dimensional case or in the quantum cohomology case. Um, so how do we split this J function into the input and the sort of the correlator component? Uh, the J function is an element of the loop space. So this is K theory tensor product with the power series, tensor product with the rational functions in Q and Q uh, minus one. And uh, this K, the curly K, uh, the loop space, admits a Lagrangian splitting into the K plus and K minus component. So the K plus component are just power series in Q and Q minus one. So these are uh, Laurent polynomials. And K minus, this is everything else. So this is everything that is not a Laurent polynomial but uh, appears in the J function. Uh, and the input, uh, so this is the Laurent part, this is in K plus and everything else is in K minus. Uh, so yeah, this is what I just said. So J is one minus Q plus the input modulo K minus. So modulo the rational function. So for example, if we take one over one minus Q, we can split this I mean, we just add Q here and subtract Q and we get one plus Q over one minus Q, this would be in K plus, and the rest would be in K minus. So with this splitting, we can actually view the correlator part, this part, as a map taking T, the input, because the input also appears here in the correlators, uh, taking T to uh, compute all the correlators. So that's a map from K, uh, from curly K plus to curly K minus. Okay, so I mean, uh, to summarize, um, we have a quantum cohomology theory and a quantum cohomology called J function, which sort of encodes all the all the quantum products in uh, quantum cohomology, and we can do the same thing for K theory. So we can modify the product in K theory, and we can define the K theoretic J function, which again uh, encodes all, all the correlators in such a theory. Now the question is, uh, so for quantum uh, cohomology, we have ways or we have methods to compute these correlators. And this is through uh, finding periods or finding Yukawa couplings and then expanding these Yukawa couplings or, or periods in uh, good coordinates. And the question is, how can we compute the analogs of periods or analogs of uh, quantum cohomological J functions uh, for K theoretic J, J functions? And uh, the way to do this is uh, what's called a supersymmetric localization. And uh, this is the basic idea. So the basic idea is to formulate a quantum field theory, uh, which I, I like to view it as just theory of maps from some space to a target space, which in most cases is a Calabio manifold or, or Calabio threefolds, at least in string theory. But this space, which is sort of the domain, uh, can be anything. In string theory, it's very natural that this is a sphere or a torus or some genus uh, 
genus G uh, two-dimensional surface, but it can be also other things. So for example, uh, it can be a disk. I mean, this was a very interesting paper by Hori and Roma, I think in 2014, where they computed uh, disk partition functions. And uh, what will be relevant in this talk, it can also be a uh, disk times an S1. So this is a three-dimensional geometry. It's not two-dimensional geometry anymore. I mean, two-dimensional geometry, I think uh, you can imagine as if you want to count curves, for example, in gromov witten theory, then a natural object here would be a two-dimensional geometry. But if you go to three-dimensional theory, uh, three-dimensional basis, then uh, you're counting something else. And so the basic idea is to formulate a supersymmetric quantum field theory on some curved space-time. This can be a sphere, a torus, a disk. And for certain geometries and for certain quantum field theories, one can compute partition functions. So these are some path integrals uh, which depend on the quantum field theory and they depend also on the target space. And um, these partition functions can have a mathematical uh, arithmetic uh, meaning. So for example, I mean, some more prominent examples are the S2 partition function uh, computes, was shown to compute the Kähler potential, show uh, the Kähler potential for Calabi-Yau manifolds. Uh, this was done, I think, in 2013. Uh, the disk partition function uh, was shown to compute the J functions or alternatively the periods of the target Calabi-Yau threefolds. Uh, the torus partition function gives the elliptic genus. And I mean, this, uh, this is uh, related to F1, so the first free energy in the BCOV uh, for Calabi-Yau manifolds. And in this talk, I will talk about some recent work where part uh, partition functions on S2, uh, sorry, on D2 times S1 uh, were computed, and they were shown to compute the K-theoretic J function of the target space Calabi-Yau manifold. Uh, this was a few years ago. Okay, so um, I, I don't want to talk too much about supersymmetric localization because we would get into physics uh, very fast. And I mean, these computations are long and tedious, uh, but they were done. Uh, so we can just uh, collect the results. And the result is that the uh, D2 times S1 partition function, there's this small parameter Q, which sort of tells you because if you have an S1, uh, you can always glue it in different ways, so you can twist it a little bit. So this is this twisting parameter. Um, it's an integral, a uh, contour integral around zero of two parts. The first part is the boundary part. Uh, so this is called the form factor often, and the other part is I. And how, the way you distinguish these two is that I depends on large Q. So all the terms which have large Q, which is the parameter that keeps track of the degree, of the correlator uh, are collected into i. And uh, for toric cases, this i is given by the following formula. So uh, c1 here is just a numerical factor. And the gamma q, these are the q analogs of gamma functions. And so this formula is really very reminiscent of what you observe in uh, two-dimensional near symmetry uh, when you compute the i function or when you compute the periods. Uh, for the toric case, there's always these gamma factors appearing. And indeed, if you take the Q goes to one limit, then from gamma Q, uh, you obtain back the gamma functions and the I function reduces to the I function of the, um, of the usual case so of the toric hypersurface. And the conjecture is that this I function, which is computed through supersymmetric localization, is the given tiles uh, k theoretic j function that I introduced before? So, in a sense, supersymmetric localization gives us a tool to compute k theoretic j functions. And moreover, the partition function ZS1 uh, D2 is annihilated by an operator, which is not a differential operator, but it's a difference operator. So, it's a Q difference equation. Um, and um, for the toric case, again, it can be written very explicitly in terms of the charge matrix uh, QI, QA uh, and the operators theta uh, alpha. And in the two, 2D limit, 
the system in fact reduces to the GKZ uh, hypergeometric systems of the or his system of differential equations. Okay, so uh, I introduced quite a few things now. Uh, maybe let me uh, go to the one of the simpler cases, which is the the quintic. So for the quintic, one can compute the partition function, um, and I mean this is really just this formula and uh, Working with this formula, I mean, a uh, changing it a little bit, simplifying the factors, one arrives at the following J function. So this is the J function of the quintic. And here P is the restriction of the tautological line bundle on P4 to the hypersurface. So quintic is a degree five hypersurface in uh, P4, uh, in CP4. And uh, if one restricts the tautological line bundle, then uh, one gets this class P. Um, the second thing uh, in the algorithm of computing the K theoretic invariance is to compute the input. So the input uh, is the, the Laurent component of the J function. So one does this in Mathematica, one does, does this in some uh, appropriate uh, computer program, and this is the result. So there's the input. And then uh, the question is how to get the correlators. And the problem is that with, with correlators in the J function, right, the correlators take the input as a parameter. So if one computes the input, which is typically a long power series, um, then you still need to then take powers of this and then plug it into the correlators, which can be uh, very difficult to do in practice. So uh, there's the reconstruction theorem, which tells you that you can actually remove the input. So by finding a suitable operator, uh, which is the exponential to this sum, where uh, psi r is the atoms operator and acts as follows on uh, q, qr, uh, so on large q, small q, pa, and q to the power of theta a, one finds the appropriate epsilon, which again, epsilon is a power series in both small q, large q, p, and q. And uh, I mean, one does this recursively. And by using this operator, uh, you can eliminate input. So uh, this is, again, I mean, it's a procedure that you implement in a computer program. And it allows you to remove the input. And why do you do this? Because then the correlators become much simpler, because you don't have to worry about the input anymore. But of course, it changes the structure of the correlators. Uh, so yeah, we recursively fix epsilon uh, to set the input to 0. That's the that's the operational way to do it. And if you do it for the quintic, then you get the following expansion. So j of 0, uh, the only thing that's left here, as you can see, are rational functions. So there is no no just powers of q to the, to the n. Uh, that term vanishes because we removed it with the reconstruction procedure. And all we are left of are the correlators, and from here, we can read off actually the correlators for the quintic and we get the K theory invariance for the quintic family. So again, uh, just to summarize maybe, uh, the algorithm is as follows. We compute the D2 times S1 partition function through super symmetric localization or we read it, we read it off in the literature what it is. And this has been done for a number of geometries. So this has been done, for example, for Grassmannians it has been done for Calabio manifolds. It has been done for projective spaces. Uh, so mostly the methods are there. We can we can really compute this. Uh, from the partition function on D2 times S1, we can then extract the I function. And the I function is just the part of the partition function which depends on large Q. And the rest goes into the form factor. Then we expand this i function, which is conjecturally the same as the j function, so the mirror side, uh, into the k plus and k, uh, k, sorry, there should be a k minus here, uh, k plus and k minus components. So we isolate the input and we isolate the correlated component. And then we do the reconstruction through this uh, given thoughts procedure. So we find the epsilon, which removes the input. And once we're done, we read off the correlators. So the, this is the this is the algorithm that we have to do, and alternatively, from I mean from just computing uh, the d two times s one partition function, 
this partition function is actually quite interesting on its own. So it really plays the role, which is very similar to the role of periods for, <coughs> sorry, uh, role which is very similar to the role of periods for, um, uh, for two dimensional. So if we look at the D2 partition function, right? Mm -hmm. So we can again write the analogs of Picard's equations which are in this case Q difference equations, and then we can investigate the properties. So, so for example, these Q difference equations have a very diff uh, very interesting singularity structure because this uh, small parameter Q is appearing, and then this Q will also have singularity. So it, there won't be singularities just in the usual complex structure parameter, but there will be also singularities in this small Q. And this plays uh, some role, I mean, when you investigate these types of functions. Okay, uh, so let me mention some other work that was done in this area. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not fully aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, about this, uh, well, I'm a little confident. This computation is done uh, uh, using periods or you're just, just some, some similarity. I mean, you have you used mirror symmetry to go to the other side to do period manipulation? For example, this Q difference, it is done directly by the definition or uh, you have used a kind of uh, mirror symmetry? Yeah, so we use mirror symmetry, but mirror symmetry, uh, I mean, it depends on what type of mirror symmetry. Right? So if you look at, for example, the book of Cox and Katz, they do mirror symmetry based on I functions and J functions. So J function is on the B model, I function is on the A model, or maybe the other way around. And these are essentially yeah, functions which collect all the correlators, and they should match on both sides. But alternatively, this I and J functions are related also to the periods. Right? So one can do also mirror symmetry with the periods, but then you have to compute the integrals. And I mean, I, I'm not actually sure if there is an analog of what's a period in this case, but I would say the closest thing is the partition function itself. So the full partition function. So maybe one question is if you, uh, I imagine that this small Q is uh, exponential of the mirror map, no? Or no? No, 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 no. no this Q, this Q is just a parameter with which you twist the S one. Okay, so it is right. different from uh, the other Q. Then. Yes. What's the analog of the mirror map is this thing here. So uh, this T Q, which is the input. Ah, okay. Uh, <coughs> this plays the role of the sort of the inverse mirror map. Um, and you set this t to zero, and this is equivalent to going to flat coordinates in the in the regular case. And I think there is even, or Hans mentioned to me, that even in two-dimensional case, you can do the J function, um, so the mirror symmetry with J function, and there will also be an input. And if you said, said there that t equals to zero, then you will get exactly the mirror map out of this. So the input, being zero is related to the mirror map. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, okay, so some examples. So I'm not fully aware of the literature. I mean, this is very recent field, but uh, some of the more interesting that uh, I observed is the construction for uh, Calabiao threefolds by Meyer and uh, Jokers, and then the construction for Grassmannians by Jokers, Meyer, uh, Neonat and Tabler, uh, Meyer, sorry. Um, and, um, I mean, recently there was a computation also for the Quintic where they reproduced the results of Jokers and Meyer. And, um, uh, finally, some of my own research. So what I am, uh, interested in at the moment is computing, um, I mean, carrying out this algorithm or this program for a special type of Calabiao manifold, which is the Rodland Calabiao threefold. And uh, this threefold can be realized as a complete intersection of seven hyperplanes uh, in a Grassmannian. And why this is so interesting is that the mirror family will actually have two points with maximally unipotent monodromy. So we'll have two mirror maps. And this is like, I mean, there's many examples like this where there's two points of maximally unipotent monodromy in the moduli space. Uh, but this is sort of the representative example that has been studied the most in the literature. And 
we are trying to understand what happens if we uh, compute quantum k-theory invariance uh, on at one point, and then what's the mirror, and on the at the other point, and then what's the mirror, and if this k-theory computations match. So if there's mirror symmetry at both points, and how exactly it works. Right? Um, so this is this is what I'm currently doing. Uh, yes. And uh, finally, let me just mention some uh, open problems. Some, uh, actually, uh, uh, Martin, uh, Dukov and Stratton has many examples of this. Yes, this stuff. yes, I know. Why, why you are not taking one of these uh, with the Picard force as much uh, when it is computed? This uh, I mean, so also this Rodland model has been studied uh, a lot. And we have the Picard Fuchs equation for the Rodland model. We have the Picard Fuchs equation for the mirror. Uh, it's just like this Rodland example is like the quintic for the for the cases with two uh, with two large complex structure or this large volume limits, right? Um, so it's the it's the prime example. Yeah. So we started with this, but of course, if we do it for this one, then we will very likely also know how to do it for the others i mean here there's just one technical computation uh, technical comp uh, complication because like for the quintic you know what classes you should be expanding uh i mean you know what's the basis of k theory right uh because you get it from the ambient space but for Grassmannians, you have to work a little bit harder to get the basis of the k theory so you have to do the sure calculus and uh you know get the basis and then if you look at hypersurfaces then you get the relationships between different uh, elements of the ambient space so you have to work a little bit harder to construct the basis of k theory so that you can read off the invariance um so yeah we took the case which is best understood in the literature just because this uh technical problem is easier to it's or faster to do Okay, uh, so some uh, some interesting problems, uh, at least for me, are to compute more examples for some interesting geometries, like for example, more of this, uh, you know, with several uh, maximally unipotent monodromic points, uh, to understand better uh, what are the properties of the J function, and what are the properties of these Q difference equations, and uh, uh, I'm very interested in this, and also Duco is very interested in this, I, I think. Uh, and uh, understand, you know, perhaps if we have the analogs of the periods, then one can maybe also construct a law enhanced moduli space. Uh, is there a filtration? Can, I mean, can one define a filtration analogously to the uh, two dimensional case? And what would that be? Uh, so, uh, I, with this, I've come to the end of my talk. I think I was very, very fast. Um, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, yes. I, I think nobody is ever angry if the talk is too short. Uh, okay. uh, so I'm, I'm happy to discuss. And um, no, I think everybody is happy also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Ah, I have to. Thank you. Uh, well, any any question? So, uh, well, uh, maybe. Uh, so there was this list of uh, maps. This uh, one was the well, the classical P one classical Riemann surface. There was this uh, from the disk, and you you said that the disk one was uh, Moro and Jokers, but is this not related to uh, uh, Johannes Walker's work? Uh, I was because uh, no. Johannes. Sorry. He, he has also computed the, the, all these open grow of and invariants. And then, then you were mentioning that uh, another article of uh, Mo, uh, Romo with uh, Jocher. I was uh, confused yes. if they are the same context, not the same context. Uh, no, no. So it's not it's not the same context. So what uh, Johannes Walscher is computing, I think, is really the count of open grow of Whitney invariants. Right? So they, they work. Uh, I mean, I'm not from. In, I'm not that familiar with the papers that they wrote, but I think they really write uh, like the analog of the periods or the, at least the variation of Hodge structure and then compute from there the open global width invariance, if I understand that correctly. Mm -hmm. But here, the computation is really, you take a disk 
and you formulate a quantum field theory on this, right? So, I mean, it computes the same thing. It computes in how many ways can you inscribe the disk with certain boundary conditions into the target space? But then you don't compute this directly by taking integrals of, you know, by going to the math side and computing periods and computing uh, integrals of the differential form, but you compute the partition function. So you compute, yeah, like a path integral, and then you can do localization computation because in supersymmetry, you realize uh, that only stationary point of the action uh, contribute and that the path integral actually reduces to a finite sum. So you can compute the path integral. And this gives you like a physics way. I mean, there is a math, uh, there is a math way to formulate this. I, I just don't know it. Um, but there is, a, uh, there is a physics way to compute the, I mean, this quantity, the path integral, and those will correspond actually to periods. They mm -hmm. will give you periods of the Calabria. Uh, 